Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 794 for November 24th, 2019. This week I'm in Fredericton, New Brunswick for the 24th annual New Brunswick Spirits Festival. Coming up in just a few minutes. I knew I was surrounded, I was the, like I was the one in 50. Um, but it just never, it never got to me. I just like, you know, I, I like to just kind of belly up to the bar with the guys. And, uh, you know, I started Women in Whiskey almost 10 years ago now. And uh, that's growing again. It's, it's slowed down a little bit. Now all of a sudden it's come back with a vengeance. And it's everybody, every woman just wants to be an equal, I guess. And, uh, but I've never felt that I wasn't uh, a part of the industry. I just kind of assumed I was as long as you could enjoy whiskey and and, you know, drink, drink uh, right along next to the guys, then uh, you're part of the group. Tish Harkis is too modest to say it, but she's pretty much the queen of Canadian whiskey. She's in her 32nd year at Canadian Club, and while her official role is as CC's global brand ambassador, her actual job description includes everything from maintaining Canadian Club's 161 years of archives to helping come up with new releases, including the new Chronicles 42-year-old whiskey that's just come out. She's also one of the founders of Women Who Whiskey, and a role model and mentor for dozens of women within the whiskey industry. I'll talk with Tish Harkis later on WhiskeyCast in depth. We'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, the What I'm Tasting This Week department, and much more. All from the New Brunswick Spirits Festival on this edition of WhiskeyCast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking, winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's begin with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. American whiskey makers are breathing a sigh of relief. While Congress has still not yet acted to extend the break that small-scale distillers have on their federal excise taxes past this coming New Year's Eve, a more immediate worry has been cleared up. President Donald Trump signed a short-term spending bill Thursday night, just hours before federal agencies would have had to start shutting down on Friday. The move gives Congress until December 20th to pass the 12 different appropriations bills that fund the federal government each year. Last year's pre-Christmas partial shutdown was the longest on record, and one of the agencies affected by that shutdown was the Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau. Distilleries were unable to get label approvals for new products during the shutdown, and it took several weeks to clear up the backlog once TTB employees went back to work. Meanwhile, there is still no word on when Congress will act on legislation to make the federal excise tax cut for small-scale distillers permanent. That bill has been sitting in House and Senate committees all year long, awaiting action. There are bipartisan majorities in both the House and Senate sponsoring the bill. If they don't take action by midnight on New Year's Eve, the two-year tax break will expire, and distillers will no longer get a break on their first 100,000 proof gallons of spirits removed from bonded storage for sale each year. That would mean significant tax hikes for many smaller distilleries who never come close to reaching the threshold to pay the higher tax rate. In other news, construction work has started on the revival of Scotland's Rosebank Distillery. Ian McLeod Distillers now expects Rosebank to reopen in the summer of 2021. The Falkirk Distillery closed back in 1993 and was gradually taken apart over the years. Part of Ian McLeod's acquisition of the Rosebank Distillery name from Diageo included access to all of the blueprints and engineering documents from the old distillery, and the distilling setup is being designed to maintain the original Rosebank character. The old distillery did not have a visitor's center, though. 
that will be part of the revived Rose Bank. Back in 2014, Tomatin released its Quattro series of single malts. They took a single day's production that had been maturing for nine years in ex-bourbon barrels and split it up into four different styles of sherry casks for the same amount of finishing time, just to show the differences that those casks can add to a whiskey. Now they're working on the sequel to the Quattro series. It'll be using three different types of Portuguese wine casks, Tomatin's Scott Frazier gave us a sneak preview this weekend. There will be a, a Moscatel de Stubo finish, there'll be a Tony Port finish, and there'll also be a Madeira finish. And each of them will be competitive. They'll be uh, matured for the same length of time in refill American oak hogshead casks, and then finished in these three wine casks for the same length of time, so we can see the comparison between the wine and the beautiful single malt Scotch whiskey. It's really an education piece, right? Totally. So it's all, it's all about allowing our consumers to be able to learn the intricacies of these beautiful wines alongside our single malt whiskey. And exactly as you say, it's totally an educational piece. We'll have more details on that series as they become available. In Canadian whiskey news, Beam Suntory's Alberta Distillers has released its first ever cask strength version of Alberta Premium, along with a new 20-year-old version they're only available in Canada. I'll have tasting notes for them soon at whiskeycast.com. Meanwhile, Beam Suntory has also released this year's final batch of Booker's bourbon for the U.S. market. It's been nicknamed Beaten Biscuits and is bottled at 63% ABV. There are four batches of Booker's released each year in the U.S., along with a separate batch for export markets. Michter's is releasing its first batch of Celebration Sour Mash Whiskey since 2016. It's a blend of whiskeys from two bourbon barrels and four rye whiskey barrels, selected by master distiller Dan McKee. Only 277 bottles will be available worldwide. The recommended retail price, $5,000 each. The Bardstown Bourbon Company is releasing the second batches of its Fusion and Discovery series whiskeys. Fusion uses 60% of the distillery's own young bourbon in a blend with a sourced 12-year-old Kentucky bourbon. And the second batch has whiskeys that are all a year older than the debut release. The second Discovery series batch blends 10, 12, and 14-year-old bourbons. Both will be available in Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, California, Florida, and Illinois. Also out of Kentucky, Barrel Craft Spirits is out with its second bottling of Barrel Craft Spirits Bourbon. It's a 15-year-old blend of bourbons, no word yet on pricing. On the Scotch whiskey front, Gordon and McPhail has released two new whiskeys in its Connoisseur's Choice range in time for the holidays. There's a 1999 Old Pulteney matured for 19 years in a refill sherry butt. It'll sell in the UK for £141 a bottle. There's also a 2004 Glenlivet single cask that's been 14 years in a refill bourbon barrel. It's priced at £101 in the UK. Douglas Lang & Company is releasing two new bottlings in its Extra Old Particular Black Series, a 40-year-old Kalila distilled in 1979, and a 30-year-old Macallan single cask from 1989. There's also the new Big Pete 33-year-old blended malt. It's finished in a combination of cognac and sherry casks with Isla whiskeys from 1985. No word on pricing. Chevis is shaking up its Royal Salute range with its first ever blended grain scotch whiskey. The Royal Salute 21-year-old Snow Polo edition is being released this month to go along with a series of Snow Polo events around the world that winds up in San Moritz, Switzerland with the World Snow Polo Cup. It'll be available at select travel retail outlets while supplies last with a recommended retail price of $155 a bottle and we will not make any jokes about snow horseshoes for the polo ponies. Finally, we don't always mention many of the charitable fundraisers in the whiskey world, but this one may have special interest for Pappy Van Winkle fans. Ronald McDonald House Charities of Kentuckiana, which covers the Louisville area and southern Indiana, 
is raffling off a five-bottle flight of Van Winkle whiskeys, including the 10- and 12-year-old bourbons, along with the Pappy Van Winkle's Family Reserve 15, 20- and 23-year-olds. The raffle tickets are $100 each and available online. We'll post a link in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. You do not have to live in the area to buy a ticket, but if you're the winner, you'll have to get to Louisville to pick up the whiskeys in person. The drawing is on December 5th. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent John E. Fitzgerald was patrolling the Rick Houses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but also for himself. Fitzgerald was stealing a taste of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side, and today's award-winning Larceny Bourbon has that same soft, smooth character Fitzgerald loved. Look for 92-proof Larceny Bourbon at your local retailer and be on the lookout for the upcoming limited edition releases of Larceny Barrel Proof. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Don't forget to join us next time around when we'll announce our next Whiskey Club of the Month. On the first episode of each month, we pick a whiskey club to receive two dozen Whiskey Cast Glencairn glasses to use at their club tastings. If you're a member of a whiskey club, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to tell us about your club. Who knows? Your club might just be our next Whiskey Club of the Month. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. If you're feeling the need to get your energy and flexibility right, along with tasting some whiskeys, Whiskey Del Bac in Tucson, Arizona will be hosting whiskey and yoga sessions every Sunday in December. Bring your own yoga mat. Whiskey Fest New York is coming up December 3rd, and Whiskey Advocate announced the dates for next year's Whiskey Fests in Chicago, New York, and San Francisco this week, along with a new event in Hollywood, Florida. You'll find the dates on the calendar at our website. Buffalo Trace Distillery has its annual Lighting of the Trace holiday celebration December 5th in Frankfort, Kentucky. Bookstock brings more than 20 spirits authors and their books to Louisville's Copper and King's Distillery on the 6th and 7th. Bonhams has its final whiskey auction of the year on the 10th in Edinburgh, Scotland. Whiskey Live Athens is December 11th and 12th in Greece. And the Cask Chasers are hosting a Drams for Fams holiday fundraiser to benefit local food banks in Maryland on the 13th in Havre de Grace, Maryland. Right now, we have 204 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a whiskey festival, a tasting, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, we want to help other whiskey lovers find out about it. Just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us, and we'll be glad to add it to the list. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause, and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Once again, I'm at the New Brunswick Spirits Festival this week in Fredericton, New Brunswick. In fact, I'm sitting at the bar at the Delta Hotel Fredericton as we're recording this episode. And I've said for a long time that I love my job, but even I don't have as much enthusiasm as Tish Harkis does. In the 14 years I've been running into Tish at whiskey events, I've never seen her without a smile on her face. She's the global ambassador for Canadian Club Whiskey, but she is also much more than that. Tish Harkis was also one of the founders of Women Who Whiskey, and she's been a role model and mentor to other women in the industry. I asked Beth Havers of Glenfiddich and Jamie Johnson of the Balveni to describe Tish's leadership. She is the most fabulous woman in whiskey, not only here in Canada, but globally. Definitely has contributed so much to the Canadian whiskey movement, 
Uh, but for all of us brand ambassadors as well, she's a dear friend and somebody that we definitely all look up to. Is she a mentor? It's fair to say? 100%. Somebody, I've now been in this industry for eight years and she's somebody I can always turn to for help and guidance uh, and just so much part of our Canadian community. Tish is the one that when I go on the road and I see that she's going to be at the same event that I'm at, I feel happy and comfortable and I know that I'm able to come to her with any sort of questions and she'll give me great advice. Uh, she is a stalwart of the community and she is so knowledgeable. She knows everything from tip to toe in Canadian Club and I feel honored every time I get to see her at an event or get on the same flight as her or get to go to CC and uh, just take a visit and listen to all she has to say. I would call her like the grand dame of uh, brand ambassadors. So she is nothing but elegant and gracious and kind so knowledgeable and lovely and uh, if I can be half of the brand ambassador that Tish has been, I would consider myself a great success. Tish Arcus also plays a critical role in new product development. She's the one who spearheaded the release of the Canadian Club 40-year-old whiskey two years ago, then pushed to create the Chronicles range that began last year with a 41-year-old whiskey and continues this year with a new 42-year-old edition. That new Chronicles edition made its New Brunswick debut this weekend, and we sat down over a couple of drams after her master class on Thursday. Let's start off by talking about the 42-year-old edition of Chronicles. This is the second in the five uh, releases we're going to see with three more coming, right? That's right. That's right. Yep. We're going to do 43, 44, 45. Yes. What's the difference between this one and the 41 beyond a second year of aging? That's right. Yeah. So... Actually, the 40 year two years ago was the first part of the Chronicles collection, even though we didn't put it on the label. So last year, uh, we wanted to, we saw the tremendous response to the 40 year old. So, 41 year old, we just didn't want to re release the same liquid one year older. So, we blended in some aged sherry and some aged cognac. And um, we did a little over 12,000 bottles of that. And then this year, uh, with a 42-year-old, again, not just the same liquid, aged for two more years or one more year, um, it is uh, infused or it's blended with some aged rye and rye malt. So this is very rye forward, burnt sugar, dark plums, uh, spicy, you know, very, very... Uh, the, the, the response to people that I've taken, because I just launched it a couple of months ago, uh, probably seven weeks ago. Um, I was in the U.S. and they went out of their minds with this one. Uh, they're saying the next big thing in the U.S. is Canadian rye whiskey and Canadian clubs leading the charge on that. So uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be, it's exciting times, not just because we're launching these beautiful, you know, we keep breaking our own record. We set the record two years ago with 40-year-old. Uh, we broke it again last year, breaking it again this year, and continue to do that. Uh, and then, like I said earlier, you know, we're going to go up to 45, stop, and then hold off until 50. But you sort of buried the lead there because this is the first one that's really available in the U.S. because the 40 and 41 weren't widely available outside of Canada. 40 was just Canada. 41, some of it went to uh, specific U.S. states, the, which is where the, you know, the, big, the largest selling states for Canadian club. Um, and I think a little bit more of 42 went over there this year. But it get very limited, very limited. Like we're talking just a number of cases. New York, of course, got some. That's where I did, you know, interviews with, with all the big, the big guys. And, uh, but they were just, their jaws dropped with, with, these, with these whiskeys. They couldn't believe that, uh, well, they couldn't believe the age statement, number one. And uh, they couldn't believe the taste, the taste profile. And I said, you know, you just cannot, you cannot fake a 40, 41, or 42-year-old palate. You've got to wait. I always say from patience comes perfection. And this is, this is the proof in the bottle. All the big guys in New York? Uh, you were one I missed because you were not there. You were traveling, I think, when I was there. I wasn't invited. Oh, oops. That, was, that wasn't me that did that. Okay, no problem, because we're talking now. And I know you don't control all the invitations for these, so I'm just busting your chops a little bit here, but uh, it happens. I'm sorry about that. You certainly should have been on the list, I know. But let's talk about this because, as you pointed out, Canadian rye whiskey is making a comeback in the United States after being ignored, that old classic term that Davin de Kergamo likes to use, brown vodka, things like that. But 
with things like the CC vintages, some of the older ones from your competitors, and even some of the newer ones, rye whiskey is making a comeback, isn't it? It is, yeah, exactly. And they were saying, you know, um, we both know this is very trendy. You're either hot or you're not. And we certainly had a nice little spike there in 2014, 2015 with the rye. Our Canadian Club 100% rye did extremely well in Canada. And then we, we launched it in 2016 in the U.S., still doing very well. But I think it's because there's so many of the U.S. brown spirits that are buying our Canadian rye and blending it in their, in their, their brands. And so, you know, it's, there's no secret anymore. Everybody knows that that whiskey tastes great and it's got all that Canadian rye in it. So now we're going to say, okay, now it's time for us Canadians, Canadian distillers, to step up and start talking about our great Canadian rye whiskey instead of just selling it off to, to everybody. Now, you've been talking about that whiskey, though, for many years, and you've had ups and downs over those years in terms of trying to get people to try this stuff and take it seriously, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, let's face it, you know, it, it was uh, from the early 80s. It's been all about single malts and, uh, you know, scotches and even, even bourbons. Uh, look, at the, look at the rise in bourbon the last 10, 15 years. It's been huge. And I guess it's just time. It's time now because... Um, we were, you know, we're that, we're that huge country with that little population, uh, the little sister of uh, United States. And, um, but for so long, people didn't really recognize the fact that we make great whiskey. And again, it's where the rye grows. It's in that very, very difficult weather conditions. Um, it's, it's, it grows through anything, so it's very robust. And uh, we, we know how to make it. We know how to make 100% Canadian rye whiskey better than anybody else. Tell me about the downtimes, though, when you were out there at festivals trying to push this and trying to get people to try it, and they just sort of walked past you. It had to be demoralizing at times. Um, that was the case of CC Premium. Um, everybody said, you know, well, the, you know, that one, this year we celebrated 161 uh, years of Canadian Club Premium. Nothing's changed. Mash bill's the same. But you know what? That one did kind of take a few kicks, uh, simply because it was kind of, that's my dad's drink. That was, we made a campaign about that, as you know. Um, but Classic 12 has always been very well respected. Uh, of course, Sherry Cask I talked about earlier, that one was well respected, 20 year. But it was hard. It was hard. I've been there, I just began my 32nd year with the brand. And it was hard to take those knocks for, you know, when we say CC Premium is the brand that turns on the lights. That's the mother brand. That's, that's the, you know, that's the flagship brand and uh, it was hard to say that but now we're seeing you know the numbers that are coming in across Canada we're winning again in Canada we're, we're ahead of the other guys uh, now so got a great campaign going on right now and uh, it's nice to see it come back and uh, you know it really comes down to it's it's mash bill didn't change we have newer wood newer wood barrels and that has a lot to do with it uh, the taste you know we've gotten 92 points from the big guys, and so we're, we're getting recognized again as that, that really great palatable whiskey. So ha really happy to see it, especially for premium. I don't think we've ever talked about this, but how did you get started with the brand 32 years ago? Very, very accidentally. I drove past this beautiful palace. Uh, I used to work for a law professor at the University of Windsor, and uh, I stopped in there one day, and I said, I think I'd like to work in this building, and so they hired me. So the first couple of years, I worked with the salespeople, and then they said, uh, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to know how this stuff is made. And so I started working in the production a little bit, and uh, specifications on the labels and the bottles, and eventually uh, got to know our master blender, Mike Booth, and... Uh, just started, started, you know, loving the whole story behind it. You cannot talk about Canadian Club Whiskey without talking about the history and the rich history and the stories. And then the fact that this is just really great whiskey. I don't have to make any excuse for any of these whiskeys. CC Premium right up to this 42. It, they sell themselves when you put them on their palate. It's just beautiful, beautiful whiskey. But how'd you wind up becoming the brand ambassador? alongside the legendary godfather, Dan Tullio, yeah. who retired a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, Danny's retired now, uh, three years, hard to believe, three years. Um, the passion, I think, just passionate for it, and uh, just really, really didn't stop trying. I wanted to be this person. I wanted to be the one that was out there talking about it, and talking about it like it's like a family member of mine that I'm so proud of. So uh, I guess somebody, somebody at the top saw that and said, this is our girl. So, now yeah, I'm just extremely proud to be a part of it and so happy to see. We keep, like I said, we keep breaking our own record uh, with the 40, then the 41, and now 42. So very proud of all of that.
What's the craziest thing that ever happened to you on the road in 32 years? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, there's been so many things. I have to say, when we were owned by Ally Domecq. Um, I stayed at the castle, uh, Glendronic. And my good friend, Bill Burgess, is the uh, descendant of Teacher Scotch. And uh, he asked me to come over, and he was going to give me the grand tour uh, before this, the, the actual session started. And so I went over a couple of days before, and unfortunately, he had a, a family passing. And so I stayed in the castle by myself for two nights, me and the cat and a couple of mice. It was unbelievable. I had a library as large as this room full of Scotch whiskey that I could help myself to. And I thought, this is a 15th century like building here, and now I'm staying in it all by myself. The lady, the, 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 I, I'm, I'm sure her name isn't the cook, but she would make my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She'd ring the bell when it was done. Do you think I could catch her? By the time I came downstairs from where I was, the other end of the castle, by the time I came, she was going up the hill in the car. So I have to say that one there is at the top, the top, top. But, oh, Mark, I've got thousands of stories, thousands of stories. It's just been... You know, back in 2008, we uh, celebrated 150 years of the uh, Canadian Club, and uh, we launched a 30-year-old. I remember that one. And uh, the, some of the, the original speakeasies that we went into across the U.S., especially the one in San Francisco, was just unbelievable. You know, it's, a, it's things like that. And so uh, just about every trip I take, every time I'm on the road, people will say, well, you have to write a book. And so I'm... You know, when I do decide to hang it up, uh, I am going to start putting pen to paper, and let's see what we come up with, because it's been a great ride. But you started this at a time when the whiskey industry was male-dominated. There were mostly guys on the road. That had to have been difficult, because I know your husband is back in Windsor all the Mm -hmm. time, and you two have been apart a lot Mm -hmm. because of this job. How hard was it being a woman on the road back then? I don't, you know, I never had, I knew I was surrounded, I was the, like, I was the one in 50, um, but it just never, it never got to me, I just, like, you know, I, I like to just kind of belly up to the bar with the guys, and, uh, you know, I started Women in Whiskey almost 10 years ago now, and uh, that's growing again, it's, it's slowed down a little bit, now all of a sudden it's come back with a vengeance, and it's everybody, every woman just wants to be an equal, I guess. And, uh, but I've never felt that I wasn't uh, a part of the industry. I just kind of assumed I was, as long as you could enjoy whiskey and, and you know, drink, drink uh, right along next to the guys, then uh, you're a part of the group. So, yeah, I never, I never felt, uh, um, uh, not, I never felt nervous around it. Uh, I understood how it was made, how it was produced. I understand the technical, you know, the difficulties in making this consistent, everybody consistent. Respected it so much. Uh, respected the master blenders. And, uh, you know, like just, like just hanging with the guys, talking whiskey. I could do that uh, all day. So, yeah. And it's changed because here in New Brunswick tomorrow night, I got to figure that probably half of the people working behind the stands at the Grand Tasting this weekend will be women. And that's something we did not see even 14 years ago when we started Whiskey Cast was equal almost, or as equal as you can get, representation. Right, exactly, exactly. It, I really noticed that as well. I noticed that in the last 10 years. Um, because when I, like I said, when I started, it was all men. A couple of women, very occasionally now, you're seeing master blenders that are female, you're seeing uh, presenters, you're seeing, you know, um, um, classes, master classes being done by females. So um, it certainly is, uh, well, they do say, and uh, no offense to all of, uh, all of you males out there, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a more defined uh, nose and palate, and um, females do. We're just born with that. And um, maybe that could be one of the reasons why, because I, can, I could pick up, you know, everything that was in that uh, whiskey. The first time I, I went through a session with our master blender so many years ago, I picked up all the notes, and he said, you've got it. You've got a good, you know. And so that, you know, once you hear, you know, kind of words like that, that, that you just want to go, 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 go. Um, but it is true. It, it is true. I think that uh, women do pick up the notes and the... They, they're, even though they're, sometimes they're so deeply buried in there, but you can, we can find them. So I think that too, and just, um, you know, it's it nothing to do with the me too. It's just the fact that we enjoy whiskey and we want to be respected and honored for our, our, um, our, our, um, our knowledge of it. That's all. And we should point out that you're still more than just a brand ambassador. If I remember correctly, you were the one who found these 40 and 41 and old vintage casks in the warehouses around Windsor and 
came up with the idea to bottle these things, if, uh, if I remember the story correctly. Yes, yeah, that's right. And when the whiskey was 38 years old, the global marketing meeting, um, we, they, we just weren't sure what to do with it. And so they, you know, and I kept, every year I was saying we can't keep, I mean, the whiskey was being very well taken care of, regaged within the bond by Canadian law, everything. Um, well, they said, okay, Tish, you bring this up every year. What do you want to do with it? I said, let's do a small run uh, for Canada's 150th anniversary. We're a young country. And uh, so two years ago, 2017, we celebrated 150 years, and we put 7,000 bottles. We knew it was the oldest Canadian whiskey ever launched. And it was, um, it was kind of a risk, but actually, you know what? I say that, the idea of it was a risk. But when I went back, that was in October, the meeting. When I went back in January, uh, a few months before it was fully 40 years old, and I pulled it, and I said, there's no risk in this. People are going to go wild for this stuff. And so we bottled it uh, in August when it was actually 40 years old. And uh, sure enough, you know, we never looked back. So, yeah, that was... Um, I'm just very, very fortunate they listened, and um, now there's no turning back. Yeah, we're just going to keep, eventually somebody's going to catch up with us, but, you know, uh, that'll be a few, quite a few years from now, because, like I said, you know, patience from patience comes perfection. You've got to wait. To get a palate like this, you've got to wait that many years. I have to ask this question, because it's been an ongoing issue for the last couple of years. You're pretty much the only person that gets to work in that building that you mentioned now along the river in Windsor, the Detroit River, the headquarters of Canadian Club because the Brand Heritage Center closed a couple of years ago in a corporate decision. I know that there have been talks aimed at possibly reopening it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the possibilities on the record? Um, it is going to reopen eventually. Uh, the, what I honestly do not know is when. Um, but the building is, uh, as you know, Mark, you visited, it's a, it's a copy of a palace in Florence, Italy, built in 1894. It's a beautiful uh, palatian uh, building. Um, it will open eventually. Uh, it's just going to look, as, as we go through some internal changes, uh, it's, it's maybe going to change a little bit, but it will be open for the consumers around the world to come back in, see the beautiful building, See where Hiram Walker himself worked, and uh, you know, enjoy our whiskeys in there. It it will eventually open. I just honestly do not have a date. And a lot of this is political in nature, in terms of the reasons behind it not opening. It's not just a Beam Suntory decision to say we're going to reopen it January first. Right. No, that's right. That's right. So we're we're working on it. I know that you know we get close, and then something else pops up, but. Um, I, I know for sure. I just don't think. I, I know for sure it will reopen. So it's just a matter of when. That's what I don't know. So, but uh, yeah, boy, boy, the day that those doors open, holy cow, we're gonna be we're gonna be cracking open some few bottles of whatever with the oldest we have at that point to celebrate. So, yeah. One of the stumbling blocks to reopening the Heritage Center was Beam Suntory's desire to be able to sell Canadian Club whiskeys at the gift shop. While those whiskeys are distilled just a hockey rink or two away at the Hiram Walker Distillery, Beam Centauri does not own the distillery. It's owned by Pernod Ricard's Corby Spirits and Wine, which distills CC for Beam under a long-term contract, but that meant that Beam could not have its own distillery shop under Ontario law. Ontario's parliament has removed that roadblock, and there are just a few remaining issues with the neighbors to be worked out before the Heritage Center can reopen. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with the Canadian Club Chronicles 42-year-old. It's bottled at 45% ABV, and the nose is nice and sweet with a touch of graininess, sweet corn, honey, vanilla, and a subtle touch of butterscotch. The taste is smooth and creamy with soft spicy touches of black pepper and allspice, balanced nicely by honey, vanilla, caramel candy, and a soft hint of oak. The finish is long, smooth, and gentle with a hint of spice. 
It's one of the finest whiskeys I've tasted in a long time, and I'm scoring the Canadian Club Chronicles 42-year-old a 94. I got a chance this week to taste Jura's The Road, which is part of the distillery's travel retail range. It's finished in casks that were used for 20 years previously to mature Pedro Jimenez Sherry. It's bottled at 43.6% ABV. The nose has notes of fig cookies, hints of heather and dried flowers, lemon zest, vanilla, and a slight brininess. The taste is thick and oily with a nice buildup of lemon zest, black pepper, and allspice, along with hints of black tea and honey in the background. The finish is long and tart with a nice lemony character, and I'm scoring Jura's The Road a 90. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey, celebrating the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit sagamorespirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. Highland Park's Valfather is the final edition in the Viking Legends trilogy, and while it will not be available in the U.S. until sometime in 2020, Canada was one of the first markets to get their hands on it. It's matured completely in refill casks, and it's the most heavily peated Highland Park whiskey on record so far. Valfather is bottled at 47% ABV, and the nose is very aromatic with notes of toffee, fig cookies, shortbread, honey, and vanilla. The taste starts off sweet and thick with a slow buildup of heathery peat smoke and black pepper spice, balanced by honey, touches of oak tannins, dried fruits, and a hint of vanilla. The finish, long and rich with lingering spices, dried fruits, and a hint of toffee in the background. I'm scoring the Highland Park Valfather a 94. Ben Romick's cask strength batch number one is a whopper of a whiskey at 57.9% ABV. This first batch was distilled in 2008 and bottled earlier this year. The nose is fruity with strawberries and raspberries, subtle spices, and hints of straw and malt. The taste thick and nectar-like with intensely fruity notes of fresh berries, peaches, orange peel, and spices that come alive in a second act and last through the long finish with clove, cinnamon, and allspice notes along with a lingering fruitiness. This one gets extra credit for complexity. I'm scoring Ben Romick's cask strength, batch number one, a 94. And finally, Beam is turning Baker's bourbon into a single-barrel expression. The first 13-year-old version has been released now. It's bottled at 53.5% ABV, the same strength as the original 7-year-old Baker's. The nose is aromatic and rich with leather, tobacco, honey, molasses, vanilla, and caramel notes. The taste is chewy and thick with good spicy notes of black pepper and allspice, along with dark chocolate, honey, molasses, and a hint of tobacco leaves. The finish is long with subtle spices and a nice sweetness. It's one Baker Beam ought to be proud of. I'm scoring the Baker's 13-year-old single barrel bourbon a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,700 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out today at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking, winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. 
Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. It's presented by Lot 40. Now, while I'm in New Brunswick this weekend, there are other things going on around the whiskey world. For instance, whiskey in the winter was Friday night in St. Louis, and apparently they had these screwball whiskey folks from San Diego pouring. Scott Harris, one of our pals from Virginia's Catoctin Creek, tweeted this to us. I'm doing booth duty at Whiskey in the Winter in St. Louis next to the Screwball booth, and the peanut butter smell is killing me. Screwball is, as you might guess, a peanut butter flavored whiskey. Why? I don't know. It's also been the subject of lawsuits recently between the founders, including former baseball player David Wells. Had several comments on the lawsuit filed last week by Joseph A. Magnus and Company against Highland Park over its Magnus single malt. Mr. K77413 on Twitter sent this. Gotta wonder why people are so keen to sue one another, especially when they are all in the same industry making the same amazing products. Copyright and product security are important, but I also am aware that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And Jeffrey Stark at GNS Buckeye 766 tweeted this, I'm sorry, but this is hilarious and strikes me as a publicity grab. The argument that a four-year-old product barely available outside of D.C. presents possible brand or bottle confusion with one of the most well-known whiskeys in the world is ludicrous. Benjamin Reed at Ranger Rick on Twitter asked this question. So here's a question for you. As far as I can tell, in the North Carolina Triangle area, there aren't any whiskey clubs. If I wanted to start one, what would I need to look out for? Are there any resources for helping new clubs get off the ground? Well, we had an interview with Andre Girard of the Quebec Whiskey Society last April, in episode 765, that offered some tips on how to start a whiskey club. But the key thing is to start small with a few good friends, and then grow from there. Now, I've had the privilege of spending a lot of time with friends here in Canada over the last 14 years of Whiskey Cast. Rick Culver tweeted this while he was here in Fredericton over the weekend. I think you almost qualify for Canadian citizenship, Mark. Not quite, but when I responded with thanks, at King of Dundas immediately fired back with this. I'm sorry, Mark, that was a citizenship test. The correct answer was, oh, I'm sorry, but we appreciate your effort and apologize for your results. I'm sorry about that, guys. <sighs> If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at WhiskeyCast, or just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that all combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. I'm with Frank Scott, who is the guru behind the New Brunswick Spirits Festival, but also the owner of the Lunar Rogue Whiskey Bar here in Fredericton. Frank, one of the things I noticed when I was in the Rogue today was this app that you're using is a whiskey menu now in place of having a hard copy menu. Tell me about this thing and how you got it to work. Well, we were always looking for an easier way to than printing 700 pages for your book and you're always constantly updating your book and you're updating your pricing and it was always a struggle to keep up your, your menu book and we call it our Bible. And we started thinking there must be a simpler way to do this and we, we come up with the idea of doing the Rogue's Whiskey and we made an app. And the app has been developed by some young university guys, and they uh, started out working, and we, we uh, talked to them about the idea, and they jumped in. They thought it was a great idea. And so we've done close to 800 of our whiskeys are all on the app. Uh, they're broken down by category, by price, by region, and uh, we have tasting notes by... We try to find the producer's notes, or we use our own. And then we also have the ABV, the price, and, uh, and the region and where it comes from. And I saw, and when I was looking through it today at the Rogue when I was having lunch, some of the specifics on some of these bottles that uh, 
you guys added in for stuff that you know about that nobody else knew about. Well, we've been very fortunate because as a chairman of the festival over the last 24 years, we've had a lot of great whiskey pass through New Brunswick. And uh, I have an opportunity to pick up some of that whiskey for the Rogue. And over the years, I've tried to buy a couple of bottles for the bar, or even more if I can afford it. And it builds up quite a nice little inventory for us. And, you know, we have a lot of whiskeys that have disappeared a long ago, time ago off the shelves of, um, of the retailers. And uh, you can only try it at the Rogue. Stuff like Glenn Flagler and, and Killy Lock and, uh, you know, Port Ellens and stuff like that. It's hard to find now, but we have it. Is this something that could be ported to other bars? Could other bars uh, learn from this? Well, I think so. I think if you're really serious about being a whiskey bar, uh, having an app would be a really a beneficial. And the, what's great about it is you can update it instantaneously. You can uh, delete. You can add w at your computer. Hit send, and it's all saved on the app. And it's available through the Google Store or the Play Store. So. Uh, all of our customers love downloading it, and uh, and then they got it at home, and they can look at, at uh, the list at night and decide maybe the next time they come in, they can pick a whiskey. Or somebody who's traveling to New Brunswick for a vacation can decide what they want before they even come in. That's right. In fact, most of the guys from the local stores, that retail stores, to download the app, and they use it as a reference for customers coming in and saying, well, can you tell us what this Lafroy 18 tastes like? And, you know, sometimes they can. They say, well, just a minute. And they hit the app, and the tasting notes come up, and they say, well, according to the Rogue, this is, you know, and we'll have the tasting notes here. So it's a, a tool that... We've been sharing with uh, our partners here at NBL, and, and even other bars can use it. I mean, it's, uh, it's out there, so anybody can use it. But uh, it's just a great, uh, we just thought it was a great idea, and it's gone on really well. We've got, you know, lots and lots of downloads, and it puts us a little bit onto the whiskey world. You mentioned that this is the 24th New Brunswick Spirits Festival. That makes it one of the oldest anywhere, but next year will be the 25th. What are you planning? Well, we're in discussions. I, I wish I could tell you more, but we're on discussions with most of the major suppliers. We are trying to see if we can source some cask whiskeys, have some special bottlings. Uh, we have had so many good supporters uh, in the industry, and they're all looking through their warehouses to see if we can get something. And uh, we're excited to, to see what comes our way, what's available, and uh, if we can get an opportunity to cask uh, and bottle a cask. Uh, even we're even trying to see if we could bring a cask to the festival and bottle it on site right from the cask. So we're trying. To, we're looking at all options that we can do, but we want to, people to, uh, to come and experience. The 25th is going to be really special, and we're going to have a lot of great special guests, friends that have come for for the last 15, 20 years. I think they're all going to try to come back and be with us. Uh, I hope we're, we're going to see. Uh, uh, Alan Winchester and, and uh, Ian Miller, there's just so many, uh, and, and you know, uh, I can't say yet, but we're working, the invitations are going out, and we're going to try and uh, really blow the doors off this place. You mentioned briefly the NBL, the New Brunswick Liquor Commission. One of the things that makes this festival unique is that we're standing right by their pop-up shop here in the lobby of the hotel, and this thing will actually expand during the grand tasting to a full conference room, doesn't it? A full retail store. They'll have 375 products available tomorrow. Right now, the pop-up shop is just pour, uh, selling the whiskeys that will be used at the 29 master classes that we're hold, holding this evening uh, in three sessions. And you, should, you can go to the master class, you can try, and you can come out and you can buy right there on the spot. So, And if you attend, we also give everybody a free cab ride back to their home. But this works out well for the Liquor Commission as well as you guys, doesn't it? It does, because uh, 24 years ago, we had this uh, crazy idea that we could partner with the Liquor Corporation and open up a festival and have them sell at the, at the show. And a little bit of convincing, but they, they said, you know, we're going to give this a try and see what happens. And we did it the first year. We sold $5,000. I thought, oh, my gosh, they'll never do it again. But they said... $5,000 we didn't have yesterday, so, and we've now selling close to uh, $450,000 uh, on the weekend, so it's, it's a great opportunity for people to try and buy an NB Liquor to showcase products, 
coming into the Christmas market. You might come in here and buy one bottle, but you can try many during the, during the festival and keep that in mind to buy maybe down the road the next day or two. So it, it really works for them. And we worked very closely together to try and work with the suppliers to make sure we can get some unique and, and products that are not available in the, in the marketplace. So we get a lot of limited allotted products that we uh, get uh, into the festival. And uh, so people come from all over North America. My first two ticket sales this year were from Seattle, Washington. And I said to the guy, you're going to fly here from Seattle? And he said, well, it's one of the best festivals in Canada. Why wouldn't I? And I went, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> It's kind of freaks you out, you know, but people come from, uh, we've got people coming from uh, Calgary, Victoria, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, Philly, New York, Boston. Word of mouth has spread about this little festival. I think we, we push above our weight. We're in a small market, but I like to use the term, the power of small. We can do things here that you can't do in a big city like Toronto or New York or Boston because it's just it's so expensive to travel there and hotels. You know, we're paying here, a, a festival rates 155 Canadian at a, at, a, at a Marriott for the weekend. So it's, we offer a lot of really great opportunities to come east and, and experience maritime hospitality in a really friendly atmosphere. Thank you very much for having us again this year, Frank. It's uh, one of the best festivals I go to each year, and I can't wait for next year. We're excited to, uh, that you're back with us, Mark, and we look forward. We, we certainly invite you back, and we hope that you'll be here next year and cover the festival because it's going to be a top-notch festival. Once again, I want to thank Frank and Jackie Scott and the entire team of volunteers who helped make the New Brunswick Spirits Festival possible for their hospitality this week, along with the entire staff of the Delta Fredericton Hotel. If you have something you'd like us to look at on a future episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast from the New Brunswick Spirits Festival. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, along with the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, the calendar of events, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. You know, we love to hear from you. You can always use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. You can also just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019. And usually comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. But this week I'm in the very wet town of Fredericton, New Brunswick at the New Brunswick Spirits Festival. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.